I always say I have a good face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're at the top of the hour. Are we ready? I think we're ready. 131 people so far. That's good. Okay, good opening. Good. Here we go. Okay. Everybody on, it looks like. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of uh, Life with Ghosts. Let's chat. And uh, this is hosted by our good friend, Stephen Berkeley. I'm his co-host, Gary Langley. And tonight, we have Dr. Noel St. Germain Sayre. Uh, so we have a very interesting interview. Please stay with us. And over to you, Stephen. Hi, everybody. Good to see everybody. This is our sixth show. And it's our, I guess, our six-month six month mark, our half-year mark. So we've been doing six podcasts so far. This is the sixth. And um, it's been going great. You know, more and more people keep on coming in. And it seems like people like the show. They're watching it around 2,000 views per show on YouTube. And it's, it's going very well. I, I thought it was a good idea before I introduce my guest to just, I guess, restate the, the show's mission. Gary, that's a good idea, right? To restate the show's mission? Sure. Okay. <laughs> So the first episode, I think I said that this show is going to be a little bit different from the movie. The movie's got the same name, Life with Ghosts, but the movie, I kind of took more of a agnostic approach. I didn't, I didn't give away that I was a believer. I kind of wanted to be kind of very balanced and let people not be completely sure where I stood. But once I started the podcast, I felt like I needed to like express my opinion or else the show would be kind of boring. And my opinion is that uh, it's fairly clear that our personal, our, our, our essence survives this bodily form. There's an overwhelming amount of evidence. I don't think we need to like be coy about that any longer. Uh, so this show is about basically celebrating that our loved ones are still with us and I'd like to, and I'm sure you would also like to learn of all the different ways that we can contact them. So we're going to be interviewing people and people, professionals and non-professionals who are in the habit of, of talking with ghosts. And um, so far, again, it's going really well. And I'm very happy about the, um, I guess, the, traje the trajectory the show is on. My guest tonight is Noelle St. Germain Sayre, and I'm going to read her bio, and hold on, here it is. Noelle St. Germain Sayre is a clinical associate professor of counseling. She is a licensed professional counselor and national certified counselor. She has, she has advanced training in transpersonal counseling and is the executive director of the Center for Grief and Traumatic Loss and the International Board, and she's on the International Board of induced after death communication therapy. Now, informally, I met Noelle when I flew to Texas for the movie to have this, the protagonist in the film uh, undergo or sit for induced after death communication therapy. Noelle was one of the people, one of the professionals on the team of counselors who were administering that therapy. Uh, she works also closely with Jan Holden, who's the director of the study. Noelle only got maybe a a very small, very short appearance in the film. I'm going to show it to you right now, just so you could see her. Just so you, you know, I'm not lying. This is Noelle tapping, and there's Noelle's face. There you are, Noelle. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was that. That was it. <laughs> that was it. Okay, so she was only in the movie for a couple of seconds, but had I known Noelle that you were smart and as cool as you are, I would have definitely given you a much bigger part. <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> um, so Noel, thank you for just joining us tonight. I'm so happy that you're here and I'm so looking forward to our conversation. I'm so happy to be here, Stephen, anytime. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I first, now the, the Center for Grief and Traumatic Loss that I mentioned in your introduction, yep. that, 
is the overseeing body of induced after death communication? What is the relationship exactly? Yeah. So um, the the gentleman who started or discovered induced after death communication, which I should mention is a therapeutic intervention um, that was discovered on accident by Dr. Al Botkin um, when he worked at the Chicago Veterans Administration. So he was working with veterans who had traumatic loss. Um, many of them in, you know, due to war, wartime situations, and uh, many with severe PTSD. So he was doing a, um, a therapeutic protocol called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR, with these veterans, trying to help them with their post-traumatic stress related to traumatic grief. So he um, was working with a particular gentleman and, and um, made an alteration to the, the protocol and um, and this individual had a spontaneous after death communication, and after that experience, um, in 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 having that connection um, with a child that um, he was had been planning to adopt during the Vietnam War, um, that's who he had his ADC with his after death communication, and um, through that experience, he had a resolution of his. PTSD symptoms, which mm -hmm. is really unheard of. It's it's pretty um, it's pretty startling that that happened so rapidly. So Al was very puzzled by this and began kind of exploring what happened here. Um, make a long story short, he started experimenting a little bit with um, bilateral stimulation, which is the um, one of the components of EMDR. Um, it has to do with um, kind of moving the, the fingers or tapping. We use tapping in the video, as you saw, um, to stimulate both parts of the brain while focusing on core sadness. And what he discovered was um, he developed a protocol and through this protocol he called induced after death communication. It doesn't induce anything <laughs> except a relaxed state of mind. But through this protocol, he was helping people resolve traumatic grief and loss. So he developed um, an organization called the Center for Traumatic Grief and Loss and um, trained therapists in this protocol. And um, that became known as Induced After Death Communication or IADC. And, um, and he basically put them together um, as uh, this, this body of uh, practitioners that would oversee the training of IADC across the world. So that's the relationship between the two. I got gotcha. you. You know, one of my favorite things about you, Noel, is that you are a real researcher slash scientist. I mean, you come across erudite and prof professorial. And I love that about you because especially when I started looking to cast this film, I wanted to make sure that people who were in it were credible. And I think that you just you always come across very critical, cre credible and sincere. And I love that about you. Um, now, you are one of the very few scientists doing this kind of research. Yes. Um, and my question is, I, mean, I know there's, there's more and more. I mean, it's becoming more, I guess, acceptable or something like that. But still, I would say there's still a dearth of scientists who are exploring this area. Why is that so? Well, I think that um, there's a lot of stigma still attached to the entire field of transpersonal counseling. And when we talk about transpersonal, we're talking about anything that extends beyond the um, the kind of material um, experience of time, space, and and ego or person. And so um, when when we look at exploring that in a scientific manner, and there are a number of researchers across the world doing research. Um, whether it's clinical or non-clinical um, research, it's scientific research into these phenomena, a variety of different phenomena. The problem is that there's still so much skepticism uh, about the validity of mm. these experiences. And I think there's a lot of fear. We've talked among ourselves as researchers about what are some of the, um, the issues that limit people's willingness to explore this and scientific community, their willingness to accept that this these phenomena, which we have documented um, for many, many years as, um, as real phenomena. 
And I say real, meaning they're measurable. They are things that we can study. Um, they continue to reoccur. They have very specific qualities to them. Um, what we've kind of discussed is that if scientists who are, who, who are not all scientists are this way, but if the scientists are coming from a very materialistic view of the world, that this is a, a very fixed perspective that we exist in a very limited framework and the brain and um, our existence, everything comes from the brain versus there may be things we cannot explain outside of our, of our uh, kind of physical material world. If scientists are coming from a materialist perspective, it can be very threatening to say that there's anything outside of that because mm -hmm. it basically uproots the, the entire belief system and everything upon which their science is based. So it's very threatening um, because it, it kind of uproots everything that they have um, built their, their beliefs on, their view of the world. So I think that's where it comes from. I think it's just a very, um, it's kind of like challenging someone's religious beliefs right? It's very yeah. unsettling. So um, we see that in the scientific world as well. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Now, when you're doing the IADC therapy, one question I get a, a lot, and I knew you, you could answer this question better than I could. How do we know those people aren't just hallucinating who are saying they, they're experiencing their deceased loved ones? How do we know they're not just hallucinating? Well, there's a real difference between after death communication and hallucination. So I think we need to start with that, Stephen, because that's one of the questions I get a lot is how do you know that a person who's experiencing even a spontaneous after death communication isn't just hallucinating? You know, we we hear this term in the literature. And in fact, I'm working with a research team at University of Virginia right now um, in their division of perceptual studies in the School of Psychiatry. And um, one of the things we're looking at is all the different terminology that's been used in the existing scientific literature, because there's a lot of different terms that have been used. It makes it very hard to um, pull together all the related literature when everybody's using different terminology. And one of the most common things we see is grief hallucinations um, or bereavement hallucinations. And hallucination is a very clinical term and it has very specific qualities to it. And some of those qualities um, have to do with things like um, it's distressing. Generally, hallucinations are not positive experiences for a person who's having them. And after death communication has been reported consistently um, in the literature by experiencers with a few exceptions, but for the most part, it is experienced very positively as very positive, healing, beneficial, et cetera. Um, hallucinations also generally are forgotten almost immediately once a person maybe is stabilized on medication or has um, uh, some other kind of stabilizing experience. Whereas after death communication experiences, individuals can remember these and recall them vividly many, many years after the fact. Um, hallucinations are also um, oftentimes experienced in isolation. You don't see people having mass, we, we have a term for mass hallucination, but it's it's not the same kind of thing. Whereas people can have shared after death communication, well-documented. Um, it's um, oftentimes people will report um, uh, kind of a shared um, a shared after death communication if, if like parents losing a child and things like that. So there's there's different qualities to after death communication and hallucination um, as to whether it is a real experience, um, it really comes down to the person's, um, you know, the person's perception. I have no way to know what another person experiences as real or imaginary, but ultimately what we see pretty consistently is that there's no convincing a person that this isn't real if they've had this experience. Um, I've had clients, I, I, I've i said, you know, you're saying it's so, it's so real, it's so real. What tells you that it's real? And they're like, I just know it. And there's, there's not, there's not like tangible evidence uh, per se, but we do have these wonderful experiences of what we call veridical after-death communication, where an individual might get information 
through that communication with their deceased loved one or their, um, we call it, oftentimes we're saying disembodied rather than deceased now, because it's just a different way of existing. So their disembodied loved one may provide them with information that they otherwise couldn't have known that can then be verified by a third party or in some other tangible way. So I've, I've heard multiple reports of this uh, and that does give us some um, uh, conclusive information that this they couldn't have hallucinated information that they didn't even know um, any other way. So. Gotcha. Now, the, the therapy featured in the film is induced after death communication yeah. therapy. And you were on the team, like we just saw in that clip, that was administering the therapy and the report that was drafted, that was you and Jan wrote the report that yeah, was Dr. published. Yeah. Dr. Jan Holden, who was, you know, the, um, the principal investigator on the study, um, she and I, and another, uh, a, a team of, of the researchers, we, we wrote a, um, we wrote an article that's going to be coming out soon in grief matters, which is the journal of Australian, uh, the Australian journal of grief and bereavement. Now I know we're not allowed to give the conclusion because it's not actually in the on the newsstands yet. But well, we can talk about the results. No, we, we, we can we can, say, we, can we, we could say something something is significant about the results. Could you just give yeah. us like the bottom line? Oh, like sure. what could, what could we say about the report? That's oh. as would be it's news because nobody else really has this yet. But you can give my this is my group. I get to spill the beans. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Stephen. We can talk about it for sure. Okay. Um, so basically, what we saw in the study was that. Um, the, um, the participants who went through the induced after death communication, we used, um, a couple of measures of, uh, of, of, we used the Hogan, um, it's a Hogan in inventory of grief related symptoms. And so the Hogan measures certain aspects of grief and, um, on certain key aspects, um, individuals were showing marked improvement, significant improvement. Um, in their grief-related symptoms when they went through the IADC protocol. And we also looked at an inventory called the Continuing Bonds um, Inventory, and that looked at the um, sense of connection that people had, that the relationship continued with their, um, with their loved ones. And we saw, again, with IADC that, that was very, scores were very high, and they had a reduction in the distressing symptoms of grief on the Hogan. So... Um, with what we did was we compared induced after death communication with traditional talk therapy for grief. What's really important here is that we only did two sessions of counseling or two sessions of IADC in this study. So in regular counseling, you wouldn't go to counseling for two sessions of talk therapy and expect your grief to be improved, right? That's just not realistic. So in, in actuality, that's what we saw. In fact, we had some people who did the traditional talk therapy sessions and actually in, in increased their distress. So of course we worked with them, we continued working with them and many of them opted for the IADC protocol after the study ended and had improvement in their grief symptoms. Those that went through the IADC protocol in the two sessions, they showed marked improvement, significant improvement, clinically significant improvement in their symptoms. So this is something that is, is in the field of counseling is pretty unheard of to have that kind of rapid relief from distress, particularly related to grief, because what we've known up to this point has been talk therapy, either individually or in groups, but it usually takes a lot longer for people to feel relief. So that's, that's the most, I think, significant aspect of what we found in the study is that this seems to be a, um, a shorter term beneficial um, treatment for grief than what we've had historically. Could we say that it's vastly superior to tra tra traditional grief counseling? Because I got Jan Holden to admit that. Will you admit <laughs> that? <laughs> I will admit that I have, that, that, the clinical results, in my opinion, um, are significantly better than talk therapy in the sense that, you know, I had a client, well, I, I worked with a lot of clients in that study, and every single one of them walked out of there with some improvement. 
And I can't say that's true for every client in, in a traditional talk therapy environment, uh, particularly with brief. So, and in two sessions, it's just unheard of. So, yeah. And again, um, it doesn't, grief is something that is kind of persistent and pervasive and it changes over time. So what we're talking about when we talk about relief from grief is we're talking about a reduction in the significant distress. It doesn't mean the person's not missing their loved one. You're going to miss them. You know what I mean? It's it's not removing the connection or the loss, but it improves the distress, um, the the incredible pain of the distress. It seems to it seems to really benefit um, in terms of some of those real significant distressing symptoms. For sure. When you were talking about whether these things could be considered hallucinations, I forgot to mention that Al Botkin, when he's asked that question, he won't answer it. And he, I thought, and you could tell me if this is true, he advised his, I guess, his therapist in the field to also not answer the question because it's up to the sitter. Yep. Is, that, is that true? Well, certainly everybody's experience is the person's experience. I mean, we, we can't, I can never say as a therapist what's real for another person. So I would never, even as a human being, I can't say whose experience is real or not real or valid or not valid. That's not for me to decide. So I think it's important. What Al is trying to say is that we, we have to be very humble in this experience um, as a therapist. And we can't claim that anything, you know, that, that we have um, some kind of, of way of knowing um, whether something is, is real or not real. It just, to me, what matters is, is a person's quality of life improved? Does the person experience some healing? That's what I'm looking at. That's what matters to me. How that happens in, in what form and whether it is, you know, mystical or, or, or um, transpersonal in nature or whether it's through something internal, I can't say. I know what I believe, but I'm not going to impose that on a client. Right. Now, in my experience with IADC therapists, and I probably interviewed probably like 10 or so for the film, they all said, yes, we're not really supposed to say, but when I said off the record, they almost seemed giddy about saying, yes, it's really happening because I guess <laughs> they're, they're somewhat constrained formally, but they wanted to tell me, yeah, I, I believe this is happening. So that was a confidence builder for me. Yeah, and I can tell you, Stephen, just in my experience sitting with clients and as a therapist, it's really was amazing to me because I experienced things in the room that I couldn't explain. So I had this client who was telling me um, she was having an after death communication first with her brother, then with her deceased mother in law. And then she mentioned that like her other relatives were there, too, but she was overcome with this feeling of peace and love. And I could feel something in the room that was just, again, this emotional overwhelm of love and peace in the room that was very hard to argue with. It's like, I could feel that. Wow. So there's a subjective experience for therapists that have, have been in these experiences. I've also felt like a hand on my shoulder kind of you know urging me on at different times. I've had transpersonal experiences as the therapist working with clients. So it's, it's, you know, again, I can't explain what it is, but I can tell you what I feel, whether it's in my body or in my, you know, experience. And I know the difference between something that I'm thinking and something that I'm kind of hearing, you know, or, you know, it's not like an auditory hearing, but it's not me coming up with it. Okay. Here's a two-part question for you. Sure. Okay. So what is the success rate of the therapy mm -hmm. and will it work for me if I'm a skeptic? Great questions. And the success rate varies depending on kind of what you look at. Again, there's, um, I think as, as more people, what Al found was in the beginning when nobody had any expectations, he was having 100% a, a success rate um, with his clients. Once he started like doing this, protocol very consistently and talking with people. This is what I'm doing. This is what people started having expectations. So what we've seen, we saw it in the study too, is that when people had a real strong, like, I want this experience, I want to see my loved one. It's like, well, I can't make that happen. Right. Um, we can't induce an after death communication. What we are inducing 
is a relaxed state, a receptive state where the distress of the grief, because what the bilateral stimulation does, just like in EMDR, it kind of increases the distress at first and then it kind of plateaus and then it drops off. At the point where it drops off, that's where people become a little more open and receptive. And when they're focusing on that core sadness related to the grief and the loss, and they've had that distress reduced, they tend to have an ADC. Um, anyway, that not everybody does, about 75%, I've heard 70 to 80%, just kind of depends, um, will report having an ADC. What's really funny to me is even though you explain to people <laughs> what after-death communication may look like, some people will describe their experience and it is, it's classified as an ADC, but they don't, they don't acknowledge, they don't recognize that's what it is. I have one client who told me she felt her husband's hand on her hand, but then at the end she goes, I don't know if I had an ADC. <laughs> okay. But you said you felt it, you know, his hand on your hand. And I said, technically that, you know, that that's, that's considered an after death communication. It's a tactile ADC. So, you know, it depends on how the person classifies it. So the second part of your question was, if First I'm skeptical. Part, oh yeah. If you're skeptical, it's even better because um, if you're, if you're really trying and you really want it, that can get in your way. If you're skeptical, you're actually more open in some regards, because even if you believe it's not going to happen, you're not trying to have the experience that doesn't seem to block people from having it. What actually interferes is when people are grasping um, like that client I mentioned who communicated with her brother, she really, really wanted to talk to her mother-in-law and she was grasping and grasping at that. And when she kind of let go of that and went into gratitude, then she had the experience instead of, I really want to talk to her. And I really want to know when she flipped over to, you know what, I just really appreciate her. And we processed through some of the grasping and she shifted that grasping to just gratitude. Then she actually had an ADC. So so skeptics have been, um, and Al talks about it in his book that he's had several, you know, skeptics that came in and, and you know, um, they actually had ADCs and some of them pretty profound. So. So most people seem to be having a successful IADC experience, but not everybody. Right. So why? I mean, even I'm, I'll take it. I'll take the win. Mm -hmm. But why isn't everybody having the experience? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons, actually. I think one of them is um, some people might have, uh, like I said, the grasping or really, really wanting a certain type of experience can block you from being open to what actually is there. So if you really want to see the person, for example, you might not be paying attention or being open to the fact that you might be having some other um, sensory or non-sensory connection. So a lot of ADC is a sense of presence. It's not that you hear the person, see the person, smell their perfume or their cologne or aftershave or whatever. It, it's, it's, you might actually not even be allowing yourself to be open enough to, to recognize an experience. Some people might not have an experience because they have a very, uh, they might have fear around having an experience. For example, there's, there were some people, there was someone in the study, for example, whose religious beliefs were such that any kind of um, communing with the dead was was forbidden and they didn't want to participate once they found out what it was about. So it can prohibit, even if there's some fear, it can prohibit somebody from being open. Remember, the key with any ADC, spontaneous or otherwise, is just being open to whatever happens and not trying and also not being afraid. If you have fear about, well, if, if, I connect with my loved one, might I connect with something malevolent, then it might block you from being open. So those kinds of things can, can have an impact. There were, um, there are some instances where a person might also have maybe a conflictual or, um, uh, they might be afraid of connecting with somebody. Um, maybe they had an abusive relationship or something like that. I had a client like that in the study and um, she actually did connect with her, her, her husband, even though they had had an abusive relationship. Um, and she had a really positive experience of that because it was very healing for her in terms of what she got from that experience. But um, 
But if somebody's afraid, you know, I'm not sure I want to connect with, you know, my father or my mother or whoever, then that may block it too. So there's a variety of reasons that could keep a person from having an experience because it relies on being open. Very good. I have to take a pause just for a moment and single out Catherine Wilson. Catherine, I know <laughs> you don't have to you don't have to unmute if you don't want to. I just want to say I really appreciate your incessant nodding and you're very validating. So everything that <laughs> everything that's been said, I see you nodding your head. And I just I want to say I appreciate your support. Thank you. <laughs> I, I didn't hear that, but that's okay. Um, so so what if? I, I know when I spoke, we heard Graham a couple of weeks ago, a, mm -hmm. a couple of months ago, Graham Maxey, who also does induced after death communication therapy. Yeah, Graham trained. And me. I want to know if if people want to have an ongoing relationship where they're deceased, if they can do that. And Graham said something about how once you know the way there, That's you it. can get there. Is that That's true? It. I firmly believe that. That's just, again, it's my experience, it's my belief. Um, you know, I really think that. Um, what is, um, what IADC does really is something anybody can do for themselves. I know a lot of people, when they hear about IADC, they're like, I want to do that. I want to do that. Remember, this is, this is a therapeutic intervention for grief. And yes, of course, it's something we want to be available for people, but you don't need it to be able to connect. Um, I think the key is um, learning how to be open and um, really deeply feel the connection that already exists between you and your loved ones. It's already there. It's believing that the connection persists that I think gets in people's way of feeling it. If you believe the connection is there, then, you know, I do think that um, it's just about getting, I think one of the other keys that IADC does is it creates a relaxed, calm state. And that there's too much mental chatter that we usually have. So meditation is something I know a lot of people have done on their own that has helped. I even had a client who was doing meditation after his mother died and had a spontaneous ADC with her. And part of that's because of getting quiet and still, getting the mental chatter out, letting go of some of the, you know, I, I need to connect, but rather I'm open and just allowing that kind of openness in a still quiet environment to be there. So the connection is there. And we've actually heard that. Um, I had a really profound uh, experience. My very last client in the study had an amazing connection with his, um, his wife, and his fiance, both of whom had had died. And um, he was communicating with them and verbalizing things as he was hearing from them and talking back and forth with them, but he was doing it out loud so I could hear the dialogue. And one of the things that he was saying is they are wanting to connect with us. They just need us to shut up and let them in. <laughs> but he didn't say it that way, but that's, that's what it sounded like to me was they really need us to kind of um, just get quiet and still and open. So. You know, that was one of the revelations I had in making a, the making of this film. I didn't realize that they're just as interested in us as we are in them. They want to hear from us. They want to talk to us. They want to assure us yeah. and they miss us. So <laughs> it makes sense exactly. that it would be equal. I talk to my mom all the time, Stephen. And um, sometimes I hear from her, sometimes I don't, but I talk to her all the time. And so I think that's another thing is, you know, if we if we continue the connection, I think there's more of a chance that you'll get something in return. My father's told me about these, um, what we refer to as symbolic after death communication, where he's seen something that um, he, I remember he told me about a license plate he saw one day that had something on it that was just like my mother talking to him. He knew that's, you know, and those kinds of things happen all the time. If we're, if we remain open and aware, it's not wishful right. thinking. I think that's one of the myths is, oh, that's just wishful thinking. You're just, right. you're just putting these connections together. And we just, that's just not what we see when we when we've looked in in research 
Yeah. I have to admit something to you, Noel. Uh, you're you're a counselor. I could I could talk to you candidly, right? It's just yeah. between us, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, right. And forget <laughs> all the other people in the room. <laughs> um, I you know I'm very open and I'm an, I'm very um, welcoming to my deceased loved ones, mm -hmm. and I'm always try to be very uh, generous of spirit, as they would say. But I, I, when I, when I, when I want to sign or haven't gotten any kind of sign and I, I can, I can get frustrated and I oh, can get, man. sometimes I even get a little bit annoyed with my deceased loved ones mm -hmm. for not showing up like I want them to. Now we had somebody on last month, Cheryl Page, who kind of, she kind of set me straight and there were in the audience too. I think she set us all straight by saying, this is not a spectator sport. Right. You have to kind of invest some time and energy yourself ask ask for what you want pay right. attention if you don't if you're not seeing signs you know ask them to help you figure right. out what the signs are so right. that was very helpful but yeah. i do i do get i wanted you to comment on this i get frustrated yeah with them that to me Stephen, is natural I get, I mean, if think about it this way, you're talking about a relationship, right? You're talking about, this is your relationship with people who are no longer embodied with us. If you have a relationship with somebody who's here and you're trying to talk to them and they're, you know, preoccupied with their phone or they're not available, you get frustrated with them too. In other words, yeah. we have this expectation that just because they're not embodied, they have all the time in the world hanging around waiting for us to contact, you know, to contact them. And they're just sitting there going, yeah, I'm here now. In other words, I think that, that it's, it is a two way street and we have to recognize that if it's a continued relationship and they continue to exist, the expectation is that we put forth effort. They put forth effort. They're, they're, they're trying, but they have to work just like we have to work to connect. We have to work to connect with our loved ones who are still here. So of course we have to work to connect with them and they have to work to connect with us. The other thing that's, that Al said that he heard from, from a client who was communicating with his um, brother, um, he asked about this, about, you know, connecting. And one of the things that the, 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 um, the client's brother said is, you know, we decide you're not in charge. We decide when we come through, if we come through, and it's always based on what's best for the person who's, who's still living, the person who's still embodied. And so it's not up to us to decide. We may want it. We may feel like we need it, but, but that's another part of it that, and again, that's, that's coming from, you know, Al's experience, but, you know, it is something to consider is, you know, we, we sometimes are grasping at, what we want without consideration for their capability at the moment, how much energy it might take for them, um, whether it's right for us, whether it's really what we need. Right. I also appreciated what Cheryl Page said last month. She said, don't forget, ask if they have a message for us because we just, we, we're just so concentrated on our own agenda. Yeah. We forget that they might want to impart something this direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like, um, <clears throat> just seeking almost like seeking a higher wisdom and just kind of being open. I, I can't stress enough the idea of openness. I mean, there's times in my life where I miss my mom terribly and I would, I would do anything to be able to, um, uh, connect with her and, and, you know, um, have her here. And I know that, um, you know, it may not be um, what I'm wanting right now might not be what I'm needing. And so being open to kind of that sense of what do you, what do you, what do you think I need right now? I'll just stay open to it. And it may come in a form I don't expect. That's the other thing. They might be helping us, but if we want it to look a certain way, we may miss it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of people will ask this question also. Can I use this therapy if I want to connect with my St. Bernard? Yes. In other words, yes. People have done um, IADC and had, well, I'll just start with this. People have spontaneous after-death communication with pets. So it, it's not, so if you can have a spontaneous after-death communication with whatever, you can, you know, have, uh, an IADC, basically an ADC that's facilitated. 
um, with with a deceased pet or you know with a, a disembodied pet. So um, and Al actually talks about that in his book. Um, it's it's pretty. He has a pretty funny story about it actually. So and Graham has told me about his cat visiting and things like that. So now I want to. I don't know if I asked this of you, Noel. Uh, would you mind taking questions from the audience? Oh yeah. I'm fine with questions. Before I, I do that, it, before I know. do that, before I do that though, Gary, do you have any questions for Noel? Gary should go first. Um, very, <laughs> very dynamic interview. Uh, you're such a great speaker. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, Graham Maxey mentioned when he was on that, uh, you know, he didn't name it IADC and he thought it was a bit of a misnomer. It is. Be because you're not really inducing anything you're bringing a person to the state of relaxation. And he said, all the work is happening with those on the other side. So, um, and you agree with that. I can see from your nods, so. I do. Well, Al said the same thing. He said, I regret naming it that, but I can't change it now because it's out there. Right. And so unfortunately, and and I think all of us in, in that do this therapy, and I'm, I am a full-time, counselor educator. So I don't have, I get a lot of requests for doing IEDC, but I don't, I don't really take new clients, but I refer, I just refer people, but, but the, um, but the, the, the therapy, yeah, it's the induction is really just inducing kind of a relaxed state. It's not, it's unfortunately named and, you know, <laughs> exactly fine. what meditation does, right? That's what I was saying before. You can do this on your own with other forms. Psychedelic assisted therapy is another one that people are talking about having the potential for um, people to have transpersonal experiences of all varieties, all kinds of transpersonal experience. It's incredibly, um, if, if done well, psychedelic assisted therapy is incredibly healing. And so there's many different types of, there's um, there's guided imagery and music, there's um, transpersonal um there's um, um, meditation, there's other types of interventions that are either facilitated or you can do on your own that can help to bring about um, these kinds of, of centered, quiet, calm, receptive states. Right. Noel, this has been delightful. I mean, really, literally could spend another hour talking to you <laughs> and hopefully we'll have that opportunity at some time in the future. Go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, thank you so much, Noel. That was a lot of fun. And I sure. think you know already, I, I love you. I'll just, say, I'll just say it to everybody. I love you. I love and, you, um, Stephen. I think you know. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for being here. Um, is there any information or any message you would like to leave everybody with before you go, whether it's your, uh, a, a mission that you personally have or contact information, if you wanted to give that, anything, anything you want to... Well Blizzard. Yeah, I put I put the IADC website in there and my contact information is available okay. through that website. Um, but the I think the main thing is that, you know, grief is an experience that's very personal. Um, it's very individual. No person's grief is like any other person's grief. No grief around one loss is the same as grief around another loss. It's all it's all very unique. And um one of the main things I think is just recognizing that um, even though people talk about having these experiences and it can be easy to think what's wrong with me if I'm not having these experiences, um, our life is really about living our lives and kind of allowing ourselves to do the things that bring us as much peace and as much joy and as much happiness as we can while we're here. And if we're, you know, I really believe in trying to, um, just take every day as this is the day that I've got. This is the moment that I've got because it's just so valuable. And I think we just, you know, for me, so much of living is about not taking it for granted. So, um, so I really want to just leave people with that. Just, you know, um, just enjoy as much as you can enjoy. And if there's healing to be had, I really believe that there's, that suffering has a purpose, but we do not have to stay in suffering we can find healing. I just think for each person, it's a personal journey. Everybody's doing their own work. Everybody's suffering. Everybody's got their own suffering. And um, I just I just believe there's ways of, of trying to support each other and help each other through that. So just want to make well, the world a better place, you know? Very well said. Thank you so much, Noel. 
Well, thank you, Stephen. I just appreciate you creating space, creating a healing environment, creating and holding space for people to share their experience, to, to be together and be curious, just to be curious. Yeah. So thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for saying that.